Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Kevin Weaver, uh, president of Brumation, and I'm here with uh, Jabian. Hi, I'm Jabian. I'm system sales for Brumation. Uh, been a home brewer for about a little over 10 years and happy to tell you guys about adding distillation to your brewery. All right. So yeah, I appreciate everybody coming out. Uh, it's a little bit earlier for some uh, than others. I know JBN's out on the West Coast, uh, so it's nice and early for him. Uh, I'm out on the East Coast here, so it's it's not too bad. Uh, but um, we want to welcome everybody. Appreciate you coming in and attending the um, uh, adding distillation to your brewery. It's certainly something that is has been uh, getting gaining a lot of traction and a lot of interest as well because uh, it's certainly. Um, uh, adds a lot of potential to breweries and it might be a lot easier than most folks would think. Um, so just to kind of go over a little bit about what we're going to talk about, uh, Javian's going to go through um, some distilling 101 for brewers. Uh, so you have a good idea if you're not already on how to, um, how the whole process works. Um, some good points on why breweries add distilling. Uh, I'm going to come back in here and uh, talk about what equipment is required and um, hopefully you'll find that you have quite a bit of the equipment already. Uh, some other additional considerations we'll go over and then Javian's going to jump back in and um, uh, talk a lot, a little bit more about some of the ins and outs on, on what to do and, and uh, how to move forward. So Javian, I'll go ahead and pass it on to you and um, I'm going to take my video off and uh, so you guys have a little bit more room. Perfect. Thanks, Kevin. I'm going to go ahead and turn my video off too, just to make the uh, presentation a little bit bigger here. Talk um, about a, a brief kind of high level overview of distilling, um, you know, for brewers, just to kind of tell you some of the differences, some of the things to look out for, um, some of the things you may know, some of the things you may not know. Um, and distillation, the process is very similar uh, to brewing. So you're going to have, you know, your mash, you're going to ferment, um, then you distill the product and then you package the product, you know, that's very close to what you're doing in, in brewing. So, um, but there are some different goals in each of these steps than, than there are in brewing. So for instance, uh, in distilling, when you're mashing, your goal is really to produce a, a highly fermentable wort. Um, you're gonna use kind of lower mash temperatures um, <clears throat> to do that. So you're gonna be in the kind of 147 to 149 range. Um, basically their goal is to get as many sugars as possible out of the, the grain so that they can convert all those sugars to alcohol. And that's, you know, their final product. That's what they're looking for. So um, some of the types of things you're gonna be mashing uh, will be the same. So you, you may still be mashing barley if you're doing uh, like a whiskey or a, a bourbon. Um, but you may add some other things like rye or corn, um, potato. Uh, for some spirits, you may even be using like just pure sugar, cane sugar. Um, just kind of depends on what your, what your end goal is for the end product. Um, so some of the stuff would be the same, some of it would be a little bit different. And then sometimes, uh, they skip the mashing altogether and they'll just buy neutral grain spirits, which are essentially a wash or a beer that they're going to just distill, um, from that product. And that allows, uh, a distillery to get started with, with less equipment. Um, and then, you know, just like you wouldn't brewing, you're going to, occasionally with distilling louder and chill. Um, some distillers will actually just move straight from the mash to fermentation. Um, there are some benefits there to that. One is you don't have to mash as long. So as a distiller, you can move the mash straight to the fermenter and you're still having conversion happening during that process. So you can save some time and do a, a much shorter mash. Um, basically just makes the, the whole brew day a little bit shorter. Um, but you know, just like brewing, a lot of a lot of distillers will still louder, remove the grain from the um, from the wort, uh, and then chill it down to whatever pitching temperature they want. Um, and then in fermentation, some of the key differences there: uh, distilling, you know, they have a much shorter fermentation time. Uh, usually, it's like two to three days. You know, could be three, four, or five days. Uh, so, pretty short time there. You're also fermenting a little bit warmer, so they're generally in the 70 to 90 degree uh, range, whereas you know most beers outside of Belgians are going to be, you know, closer to that 65 to 68, uh, unless you're doing a lager, which would be even lower, you know, in the 50s. Uh, and then the final product they're producing is called wash, whereas uh, in brewing you're obviously producing a beer. 
Um, one other thing to note is that some, some products and some distillers have a preference of uh, fermenting on the grain and potentially even distilling on the grain. Um, and that's just to add some additional character. Um, but also while doing that, you got to keep in mind that if you're going to do it that way, you know, you're probably also going to carry over some, some off flavors that you'll have to age out. So you typically would see this on something that's definitely going to be aged like a, a whiskey or a bourbon. Uh, and then here's one of the differences in the next step is instead of moving on to, um, you know, uh, <clears throat> packaging right now, you're going to move on to distillation. So basically you're going to run that, that wash product through your still. Um, the goal here is to separate the ethanol from the wash to create your final spirit. Um, and then the, you know, potentially different mashes are going to produce different spirits. Um, and then you might have a different distillation process as well. So you may run it through just a pot still uh, to get, you know, a simple uh, full flavored spirit like a bourbon or a rum, uh, or you may run it through a, a big column to create a more neutral spirit like gin uh, or vodka. And then your configuration of your still then, you know, kind of, as I just mentioned, would be different depending on what, what kind of end product you're making. So if you want a full range of stuff, you'll probably end up going with uh, a column still, um, just because you can make about just about anything with that. Um, but if you're really hyper focused on something like rum or uh, bourbon and whiskey, then you might just have a pot still. Um, then there's an intermediate step that sometimes happens between distillation and packaging, which is your aging. So a neutral spirit like vodka or gin, you're obviously not going to age. Um, but some of the, you know, very sought after, you know, very delicious spirits like bourbon and scotch, uh, cognac and rum. Uh, there may be an aging process there between your distillation and your packaging. And how that differs from brewing, you know, you guys are generally, I think, looks like uh, many of you have a brewery or looking to start a brew distillery. So you probably know this process a little bit better. Uh, brewing, it's, you know, mash, um, louder, then you're going to boil ferment. Uh, you may age depending on the product and then package and then, but you're doing so with, uh, slightly different goals in mind. So for mashing, you know, our warp production is, uh, very fine tuned for the specific beer, you know, the desired flavor, mouthfeel, color and fermentability that you want in brewing. Uh, you may want to, you know, dry beer versus sweet beer, which determines your mash temperature maybe going for uh, you know, a certain mouthfeel, which also may be affected by the, the mash temperature. Um, so we control that very, very precisely in brewing. Uh, also, loudering, this is typically not an optional step in, in brewing. Uh, you're pretty much always going to remove the grain from the, uh, <clears throat> from the wort uh, and then move on to, to chilling. And for brewing, we don't always want the most fermentable wort. You know, sometimes we want uh, some sugars left in there and some, uh, to create a, a, you know, a thicker beer. Um, and like I said, this is optional for distilling, depending on what kind of product you're making, but in, in brewing, it's, it's essentially necessary. Um, a step that you don't do in distilling typically is boil. And the reason we do that in brewing is to isomerize hops and to reduce SMM, which is a uh, DMS precursor. Um, maybe not as big a deal today with some of the highly modified malts we have. Um, but still, those are the, kind of the two main reasons we do it and to, to sanitize the, uh, the product before it moves on to the fermenter. Um, then you chill to your pitch temp, move the product over to your fermenters for fermentation. And our goal in brewing is, again, we're controlling temperatures a little bit more precisely than a distiller would. Um, and that is for, you know, reducing off flavors. Um, a lot of distillers have a, a mindset of, you know, just produce the product and the still will get rid of all the off flavors. Um, whereas brewing, we're not distilling anything. So we got to, every step is kind of fine tuned to reduce off flavors. Um, you know, sometimes, you know, your fermentation will be pressure regulated, depending if you're fermenting under pressure or if you're, um, going to use like a spunning valve to carbonate at the end. Um, and I think this is arguably 
in brewing, the most important step is, is your fermentation. So uh, it's a longer, slower process uh, designed to keep yeast happy and, and develop the flavors you want and keep out the flavors you, you don't want. Um, if you age your beer, um, then that would be the next step, which would be you know something you do with imperial stouts and porters, potentially uh, sour beer, some experimental beers. Um, you would also be doing that in, and then you move on to your packaging. And also a little bit different here, there's a lot of packaging options in beer. You know, you can serve from a serving tank, you can put in a keg, a can, uh, a bottle, whereas in distilling, you're typically just seeing um, bottles that are not pressure rated and most typically in 750 milliliters. Um, so some of the key takeaways there is, um, you know, brewing versus distilling. Your grain to glass time for distilling is, you know, with, you know, not accounting for any aging you might be doing is about four to seven days, maybe 10 days max. Uh, whereas brewing, you're more in the 10 to 14 days, maybe, maybe a little longer for um, a bigger beer. Uh, equipment differences or equipment requirements, distilling, you're looking at, you know, most basically a mash ton fermenter still. Um, you might need an HLT depending on depending on your process. You might have a uh, on-demand water heater. Uh, you might be heating water in the mash tun. Um, so, you know, pretty pretty basic in terms of what equipment you need. Brewing typically a lot more stuff. So you have your hot liquor tank, your mash tun, boil kettle, uh, fermenter, bright tank. Um, so yeah, so there's a, a little bit more equipment in brewing. Um, the production cost versus unit cost. So in distilling and brewing, your production cost per batch is going to be the same for the same volume. Typically, um, the cost of raw materials is about the same. Um, but the end product for distilling, you're going to have a product that nets a lot more money per ounce. And brewing, you're going to have a product that produces less money per ounce. Um, but you're going to have a lot less of the product in distilling and a lot more of it in brewing. So it's, um, you know, kind of a wash there in terms of how much you make per batch. Um, and that's what this next part talks about as well is the relative revenue per volume, high revenue product in distilling, uh, a lower revenue product for, for brewing. And <clears throat> so the key takeaways, basically just to give you kind of idea, if you're going into this, things you need to think about, uh, are you gonna potentially have some different ingredients? You're gonna have to either learn some new processes or hire somebody that knows those processes and build that into your business. Um, if you're an existing brewery, um, you definitely need some additional equipment, but you're gonna have most of this equipment already. So that's one of the reasons it really makes a lot of sense to, to add distilling. So, so some different equipment, but you may have some of it. Um, different production time. So something you need to think about when you're, when you're planning out your months is, figuring out which tanks are going to be dedicated to which products because uh, they have different time schedules. Um, there's a different, you know, potentially a different cost to produce depending on what you're distilling versus what you're brewing. Uh, the products are going to sell at different prices and they, they have kind of different floor space and safety requirements as well. You know, distilling has, uh, you know, a lot of ways can be more dangerous than brewing is. So you have to take those safety requirements uh, into consideration uh, as well as some additional floor space you may need or different, uh, potentially a different build out you may need to put that equipment in your brewery. So um, basically understanding these differences um, and how they affect your, your current brewery and production schedule is, is the best way to kind of plan moving forward um, on if you wanna do this and, and how you wanna do it. So now that you kind of understand kind of the top level basics of distilling and how it's different from brewing, why would you even want to add distilling, right? Well, it comes down to a few things. Uh, number one, product diversification. So, and if you have just a brewery, um, your product diversification is all essentially just different beers, right? So you have a stout, you have an IPA, you have a Saison, that's how you're diversifying your, your products. If you add distilling, now you can add, you know, a gin and a whiskey and a bourbon, um, you know, potentially hand sanitizer, you can add um, all these other products and maybe 
you know, one of these products becomes your, your go-to, you know, maybe it was your IPA that was selling really high and, um, but now you have a, a whiskey that's incredible. And so now your whiskey is also selling an incredible amount, just gives you, um, some more options, a way to serve more customers. Um, and, it, and it's kind of cool, <laughs> right? Um, another reason to, uh, you know, diversify is it's a, uh, crowded market right now. Um, craft brewing is still growing, um, but it's growing much more slowly than it, than it was in the past. Um, <clears throat> still on the rise, but yeah, it's slowed a little bit. Um, so to, to appeal to like a wider audience, um, adding distillation yeah, is a good way to do that. You know, you could be the next, um, the next best, uh, whiskey, the next best bourbon, next best tequila. Um, especially in markets like Portland, San Diego, Minneapolis, these kind of, um, early adopters of craft beer, things are so competitive there that it's, it's even hard to open a brewery anymore. Um, so a stat that I saw from the Brewers Association is that craft beer grew by, I think 4% last year, um, which is a lot less than, than in previous years. Whereas, uh, craft distilleries grew by 15 and a half percent. So there's obviously a, a huge demand for, for craft distilling. Um, and just to take one, one kind of distilling product, gin alone grew by, you know, 14.7%, almost 15%, um, from 2018 to 2019. So there's a, a big growing market there just for, for that one product. Um, so now that you've diversified your, your products, um, you know, what you're also doing is diversifying your, your profit centers. So the ways that you make money. So, <clears throat> you know, even in non COVID-19 times, um, having a, a wider range of products, you know, helps to insulate you from, um, you know, just a decline in, in craft beer or, you know, other things that may happen in your business. Maybe, uh, you get hurt or some key employee gets hurt and, it costs you money to, or leaves the, your company and it costs you money to, to hire and replace that person. Um, having extra profit from other, from other, uh, profit centers can help alleviate some of that stress. Um, in addition, when you are in a crazy time, like right now with COVID-19, you're seeing a lot of these distilleries, uh, are turning towards making things like hand sanitizer. Uh, some of them are selling it. Um, so it's a great way to make some additional money when, when things are really hard. And some of the distilleries in a even better position financially are, are giving it away for free to those who need it. So not just as a, a good way to make more money, but it's a, a great way to help the community and, 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 you know, help your community. We did a, uh, a poll of brewstilleries kind of just asking what they thought the most important part of adding a distillery to their brewery was. And, uh, you know, unanimously, they said it was diversification of income streams, just a, a way to get, more money and, and reduce that risk. Um, and then my favorite reason why you should add a distillery if <clears throat> you already have a brewery is you kind of have a lot of the equipment already in place. So there's some, you know, economies, uh, not of scale, but of, of having that equipment already in place that really all you need to add is essentially a still, right? Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And because you're, you know, as we talked about before, we're already controlling temperatures really precisely in the mash and in the fermenter. Um, you're producing wort and beer that is is very high quality uh, and we can be considered a, a really high quality wash. So if you're already doing these things, you know, best practices, um, when you distill it, um, you're gonna end up with a better, better quality product. So I have the um, mentality of, you know, good in, good out. So some, uh, as I mentioned earlier, some distillers just rely on uh, the distillation process to remove a lot of the off flavors and components that you don't want um, in your final product. Um, but that doesn't work all the way, right? It'll get most of it out, but some of it will still be there, which is why it's, you know, primarily the reason that some of these spirits actually need to be aged at all is because there's, there's things in there that you need to age out. And if you're already producing incredible, incredible quality wash or incredible quality beer, then uh, I think you got a leg up on a lot of these craft distilleries. 
Um, <clears throat> so next we're going to talk about uh, some of the equipment that you need and, and how it works and, and what it looks like. And so I'm going to pass over to Kevin to take on from there. Excellent. Thanks, Damian. That was a um, great precursor here up to uh, talking about some of the equipment. Uh, so I'm going to get right into it, turn off my webcam. Just want to say hello to a couple of newcomers that came in. So uh, got some folks from far and wide. Got uh, some Costa Rica. I think we might even have Mexico. Um, but anyway, welcome again, everybody. I'm going to turn my uh, camera off and talk a little bit more, dig into some details on the equipment. All right, so JB and talked uh, quite a bit about um, having equipment in your brewery already. Um, so I'm gonna also talk about, you know, what equipment is needed. So it's, it's a little bit of a combo. So if there's some folks there that are, you know, not a brewery and looking to you know, start a distillery, you'll, you should draw some, some good information out of this. Um, but also, you know, as far as uh, having equipment already, I'll go into a little bit about what equipment can be used and what, um, tweaks can be done in order to uh, reuse and, and create some different processes. So really the end product um, in the distilling process does drive some of the equipment needs. Um, and we'll, we'll get into that as we go through, but um, the process starting here from the beginning. Um, in a brewery, you're gonna have a hot liquor tank, you're gonna have a mash tun. Um, if you don't have a hot liquor tank, you may have an on-demand heater as an example. Um, so you know, different, basically you need that hot water. Um, if you have a hot liquor tank, then you're gonna be you know, able to make some adjustments to your water, um, adding you know, uh, various ingredients to balance it, get different profiles, et cetera. Um, so I would say the, the vast majority of the breweries um, do have hot liquor tanks and they are treating their water. Um, so hot liquor tank would be there. And then moving over to the, to the mash tun, uh, there's, there's some different designs out there. So and back to the process driving the equipment, um, you know, the two generalized methods of distilling would be either you're going to distill a clean wash that um, is basically sparge, just like you would uh, in a brewing process, or you might be distilling with the grains in. So kind of a grain in or grain out type of, of uh, distilling. So if you have a mash tun already and your desire is to do a grain in, that could pre present a couple of difficulties. You might have um, you know, false bottom that's permanent that you can't remove. So it'd be impossible if you have the false bottom, you know, without some modifications to get that green out of the mash tun um, and then over into uh, the fermenter. Um, if you're going to be doing a sparge and, you know, there's a lot of schools of thought out there about sparging, then you're going to be able to uh, sparge and come up with a nice cleaner wash. Um, you know, some folks want that character, though, of, of the in grain. So it's a decision that really has to be made. Um, now, since we're not boiling in this process, we're going to go right from the mash tun to fermentation. Then what we have um, is a couple, a couple options. So you could cool in the, in the mash tun. Uh, you know, we have uh, mash tuns that have double jackets on them. So you could heat and cool in the mash tun. Um, now, likely you won't have that in the brewing space. So in that case, you're gonna to wanna to do some cooling. So if you're gonna be doing a grain in, uh, that next, you have three pieces of equipment stacked up um, there in the middle. One's a plate chiller, which most of us know. The one above that is a tube and shell. And above that is, is showing an inline uh, strainer. So I'll talk about that a little bit. But if you're doing grain in, then you can't pump your grains through a plate chiller. So what you would end up doing is using that tube and shell, and that tube and shell is basically um, a long tube that you know, continuously flows through in different angles. And it will um, uh, cool it as it goes through and, and go into the fermenter. You know, grains and all, you're basically pumping the whole mass. Um, and obviously you need a different pump than typically you would have, or some, some of you do have a separate water ton, so then that would be nice and easy because you could just, you know, go ahead and skip the lauder tongue, go right through the tube and shell like you've been doing otherwise, and then go right into the fermenter. Um, if you want to kind of stick with your standard equipment, if you have a plate chiller and you are sparging, then you can pump your sparge liquid right straight through the plate chiller. Um, but there's a couple of things there to be uh, cautious of. And, you know, as we know, sometimes we do get some grains that get through a false bottom, depends on how the false bottom fits, et cetera. 
So we don't want to go ahead and plug up the plate chiller. So that's where that inline um, uh, strainer comes in. We basically size that strainer so that the holes are slightly smaller than what can pass through the plate chiller. And there's not all, you know, hopefully there's not a lot coming through. If there is, then you know, that's something that would need to be rectified. But uh, having that strainer will protect your plate chiller and allow you to pump through and uh, pump through the plate chiller and into the fermenter so you're at uh, the perfect fermentation temperatures. Um, another consideration is to have a nice even flow uh, coming through there. So typically we would try to use um, perhaps even a, a peristaltic pump for the sparging because if it's a positive displacement, that peristaltic pump will be nice um, with the ability to you know, have a nice even flow and push through the plate chiller into the fermenter. So moving over to the fermenters, and um, there's two types of fermenters. Uh, the, the typical one that you'd have in your brewery, um, which is pictured dead center on the screen there. Um, and then there's one that would have an agitator in it, uh, the one to the right of that. So if you're just doing your standard sparge, then the standard fermenter will do the trick and you're gonna ferment like you, you know, typically would. Um, you know, there's no additional equipment that would be needed there. Um, if you are doing grain in and you're gonna want a fermenter that's, that has the agitator in it, um, that's gonna allow you to you know, move that product along. It's gonna be able to mix, keep things fluid, et cetera. So those are, that might be an addition, but since you already have the equipment, um, you're, you know, again, school of, schools of thought, but you may have a nice clean fermentation, um, you know, using a nice clean sparged wort. Uh, then from there you go into the still. Uh, so again, grain in, you're gonna continue that grain that's fermented and, and pump it right into the still. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more um, about the distillation here in one of the next slides. Um, so actually kind of, I'm just gonna go back here real quick just to summarize. Um, if you really take a look at this, if you have your own brewery, um, like we've been talking about, you have a hot liquor tank, you have a mash tun, you have plate chiller that we could go through and maybe just add a strainer, a pump, then you got your fermenter uh, that you would have. And then from the fermenter, you're just gonna pump into the still. So basically everything leading up to the still you have, um, another item I forgot to mention is, is, the, is the chilling, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. Um, but typically, you're going to have a glycol chiller, and then we have to look at the capacity of that glycol chiller to see if it's able to handle the distillation uh, requirements. So we'll talk about the, um, uh, the components in the still and what you need. Um, you know, there's, and again, it depends on what your final product is. So we just put a picture up of a pretty, pretty basic still here and, you know, but does have some of the features and, and we'll kind of go through them. So when we put uh, stills together, uh, we start talking about the, the various uh, products that you want to produce, uh, what your goals are, but you're always going to have a pot, um, you know, that's going to be holding your wash and that's where we're going to heat it. Uh, different heating uh, mechanisms could be uh, steam. So if you have a boiler, uh, you can use, utilize that. Uh, to, to heat the uh, still, heat your wash. If you wanted to go electric, uh, we would typically go with a, a Bain Marie style, which is um, that jacket. And actually that picture is a Bain Marie. If you kind of look above the jacket, you see a little funnel there. That's where you add the, the heating oil, which creates the jacket. And then at the bottom, if you see the rectangle, that's where the heating elements are. So we're heating the oil that is the jacket, which will then therefore heat the, um, the wash. Uh, it's kind of a nice way to do it. Bain Marie has been around forever. Um, you know, for cooking, you've probably heard about it, um, you know, melting chocolate and things like that. But, um, <clears throat> and the Bain Marie is a nice safe way to go, especially when you're looking at electric, uh, some more that we'll talk about here in a little bit. Um, and it's also a gentle heat with a Bain Marie. So if you're doing um, gins and your process would be to have your botanicals in the pot, as opposed to in a gin basket, um, you know, some feel that that's a better way to go. A Bain Marie is a nice way because you're not going to risk burning some of those um, botanicals that would be in there. And it doesn't have to be just gin. I mean, you guys, brewers are the most creative bunch out there. And um, what's kind of neat is some of the some of the spirits that are coming out of uh, brew distilleries. So um, you can think of anything that you might want to put in there. And, you know, if a, a nice gentle heat is called for, then Bain Marie is a nice way to go. Um, but steam would be used as the other means. Um, so that, that's that's the basics of the pot. Um, so you're always going to have one. It's just a matter of choosing what kind of heating source that you use. Now, the mixing motor, um, you know, we have a, a little mixer in there, and that is an absolute necessity if you're doing grain in. Um, if you're doing regular sparge wort, um, you don't necessarily need it, but um, it's nice to have because it does keep things moving. 
again, if you're doing um, botanicals, et cetera, in the, um, in the pot, it's nice to, to get those you know, swirling around so you get a lot of surface area. Um, but it also does help the heating because you're moving things, um, hitting, getting a nice even heat, which is really what you want as you start to uh, liberate the, uh, uh, the alcohol out of the uh, wash. But it's still something optional, um, you know, when you start looking at trying to do this a little bit more on a budget, you know, removing that mixer motor is certainly an option. There's tons of, tons of stills that are doing it that way. Okay. So now we look at the next um, couple pieces here. You have um, shown here is a helmet and a line arm. Now, there's so many different shapes of helmets that people come up with, and there's a lot of different um, chemistry type of um, reasons. There's you know, people swear by one style or the other. Um, so, you know, the helmet design is something to research and kind of kind of look into to see, you know, what might suit your needs. Uh, the one shown there is a pretty typical helmet style. And what, what that does is as, as the vapors, um, you know, are, are, are going into the still, I'm, I'm not really gonna get into a lot of the chemistry stuff, but it, it, it will certainly change some of the profiles. It will um, do some reflux to knock out, um, you know, knock down that, uh, the alcohol back into into liquid form, raising uh, the boiling point, starts to do some purifications, et cetera. So it's kind of a first pass. It's, it's, it's definitely an art um, uh, to that particular piece. And same with the line arm. Uh, there's different style line arms, the ones that tip down, ones that might just go horizontal. And most of the time, the helmets and line arms uh, may have more to do with the, the various whiskeys that are being produced. Um, again, that's probably a whole seminar in itself about um, the ins and outs of, of these particular designs. Um, but as you go through it, those are different options. I mean, if you're just making some straight vodka, you may not need some of this. And you know, as you could see there, it's um, in this particular case, it's all copper. So that definitely adds to cost. Um, kind of the rule of thumb is copper up, stainless down, meaning that you have all your parts that are copper um, you know, for your vaporization. And then when you look over at the condenser, uh, it's a stainless. Um, and there's some reasons behind that. Copper has um, you know, some properties that lend itself very nicely to, um, uh, to the distilling operations. Okay, so moving on to the column. So in the column, uh, you know, it could be this particular one has what, six plates in it. Um, there's, I've seen columns with 20 plates. Um, it, it really depends on what you're making. Um, the more columns that you have, your tip, if you have something like 20 plates, you're certainly making, um, you know, vodkas, gins, things along those lines. Because in essence, each one of those plates, each one of those circles that you see in there is, is in essence doing its own distillation. Um, so as you go through, it's going to be um, distilling, um, getting reflux, knocking it back down. You know, some of it's going to be going back into the pot to be liberated, and that's going to work its way through all the plates. And in essence, very generalization, it's purifying um, that alcohol as, as it's being made. Uh, you could also have multiple columns um, after it goes through the first column, and then um, uh, go, it can then go into the second column for further purification. Um, so there's, there's a lot of different um, things to consider there, and you know, that's something you know, to take a look at how many passes you're going to do. So in other words, sometimes you may end up doing just a stripping run. So if you see there's a three-way valve um, right between the, um, the column and the condenser, sometimes you're gonna skip the column altogether, especially on a first stripping run. You're gonna wanna um, get that alcohol level a lot higher uh, and get ready for your spirit run. So you may, may do, you know, four stripping runs. Uh, and that's how you kind of size your pot um, is to get enough stripping runs that then you have a spirit run that's going to fill up uh, the pot for your actual spirit run. So there's definitely calculations in there as far as sizing, sizing concerns. We usually work through our customers um, on those, you know, depending on how big your brewery is, how big your fermenters are, et cetera. So we can get good batch sizes and start talking about stripping runs and when you want to do your spirit run. Um, also up top, it, um, there's, um, I don't know if we show that on the next, we get right to the gin basket. Um, but just below the gin basket, there's the, right at the top of the, um, uh, the copper column, um, and this gets pronounced a bunch of different ways. I call it the deflamator. Um, basically what that does is another cooling mechanism in there, uh, which causes some more reflux and um, adds to some of the purification. So a lot of times that those vapors will be rising up through the different plates. And especially as you're starting up, you know, to regulate some of your heads, 
um, you're going to be cooling that just to kind of run through through your your process one more time. And, and I'm, I am oversimplifying some of the uh, the chemistry there. So those of you out there who really know your distilling stuff, you know, I'm just trying to keep it general. Um, so the next piece here is the gin basket. Um, this particular one, it's a small, very small still. This this one, and um, we have the uh, gin basket sitting up top. It's a nice, easy way, economical place to put the gin basket. Um, it's not the most convenient, but since it's a small still, it's easy easy to get to. Uh, on the bigger stills, we'll put that gin basket down on the uh, liquor locker, uh, which is the, uh, the square uh, stainless piece down at the, down below. Um, some of them are large, depending on how many different additives. I mean, we call it a gin basket, and typically it is gin. Uh, you have your botanicals in there where the ethanol is flowing through the botanicals to pick up the, you know, the, the juniper flavors and, and, and aromas. But you can really put anything in there. Um, we have an R&D system here, and um, I'm going to put coffee beans in there and try it out. Maybe that's a horrible idea, but, hey, that's the creativity in me that I want to try and make, make a nice coffee look work. But you could you could get very creative with a gin basket. You could put all sorts of different things in there, uh, you know, different uh, flower flavors, um, uh, really you name it. Um, so that's definitely a nice creative way to go uh, to have that in the vapor path. And also it could be bypassed. So it's not that you know you're always going to have to go through the gin basket if you're going to make a straight up vodka. Then um, you know you bypass that gin basket and just go straight to the condenser. But that's definitely a place that you can get very creative. And then of course there's the condenser. Um, so now that we've liberated the alcohol, we have it in a, in a gaseous form, uh, we need to bring that back to a liquid form. So it's, it's, it's purified at that point, um, you know, depending on if you're doing a stripping run or a spirit run, or if, you know, sometimes you might do a, a third run for um, a, you know, more concentrated spirits. But in any event, this is where we need to take that um, and turn it back into a liquid. So we're condensing it with uh, cold, either cold water, ethanol, um, Talk a little bit more about what cooling means that you could use, uh, but that's where we're we're condensing uh, the alcohol. And if you look down at the bottom, there's actually three ports on this particular still. Um, you kind of see the white. There's a temperature probe we put in there um, for a safety monitor. But we have the three outputs that you could connect: uh, your heads, your tails, um, and your uh, and your hearts. Of course, uh, would be what you're what you're keeping. So. You could all, you know, do that and just keep swapping in containers, or you could hook up three different containers and, and then, you know, judge which one you're you're going into. Um, so cooling, we're gonna get into cooling here a little bit on the next slide. Now, um, cooling, there's there's two places that you're gonna do the cooling on the still itself. Uh, we talked already about the mash tun. Um, you know, as far as brewers, uh, you have a, a good idea about cooling that wort. Uh, or cooling the mash tun, but what I'm kind of talking about here is, is what cooling you need for the still itself. Um, we have uh, the condenser, obviously that needs to be cooled, and also the deflamator, or deflamators, there may be two of them, uh, that need to be cooled. So uh, there's different ways to do it. A lot of um, stills will use straight water, um, just run water through it during the entire process. And it's amazing how many people actually do it that way. Um, the drawback obviously there is that you're using a ton of water to do that. Um, I've talked to some you know, local still distillery, uh, distilleries. I said, my God, you, they even use water for cooling the, um, uh, uh, the fermenter. But they said our water costs are so low uh, that it, it just does not justify using the glycol chiller. Um, but it is a ton of water. But yes, that is an option. You could use straight water. But the nice part now on... The folks that already have a brewery that are looking to do distilling, um, you likely have cooling. And that's one of the things that you certainly want to consider is how much cooling do you have? Do you have enough? So when we look at that chiller capacity, and hopefully you have some extra in there, um, and especially if you're running a, a two-stage plate chiller, you're likely going to have a bunch of um, extra capacity. And if you're not running that two-stage plate chiller at the same time you're running your still, you may have enough capacity. Um, so all that has to be looked into, but there are different ways for us to tap into that um, cooling capacity. We could use partially water, just like a two-stage chiller. We could do some some chilling with the water. We could do some chilling with the uh, glycol chiller. Um, this this diagram that I have up there is a kind of a unique way to um, kind of separate a separate circuit 
for the still, but still using the same glycol loop that you have for all of your fermenters and bright tanks. So in essence, we would end up, as you see that heat exchanger down below, um, we're just running your glycol through the loop, turning it on and off through that heat exchanger. And then we're running um, a, its own cooling loop for the condenser. And what's nice about breaking it out that way is that you could also have um, a water in and water out um, a situation where you could actually use water just in case your glycol chiller goes down in the middle of a run. You could certainly jump into that uh, water and we even automate that too. Um, I mentioned earlier about uh, monitoring the temperature of your parrot. That's, that's the output of the uh, still. If that starts to get too warm, then that tells us that the, the ethanol vapors are getting through the condenser and not condensing, and that's a dangerous situation. So in that case, we would trigger the water um, to, to make sure that we do chill that down and then do an automatic shutdown of the still. So this is just a nice idea. Um, and you know, I'm not saying this is an absolute must. Uh, it's just another way to integrate chilling of your still if you ha already have a chiller in place for the rest of your process. So some additional considerations. Um, JB mentioned earlier um, a little bit about um, the safety aspects of running a still. So the big thing that hopefully everybody's thinking of is, hey, how is it dangerous? Um, you're dealing with ethanol vapors and you're dealing with flammable ethanol. Um, so it's a, it, is it dangerous? Well, yes, it could be. Um, but if you do things right and you do things properly, it's not dangerous at all. Um, and that is quite honestly one of the things that I see very commonly in stills, uh, still installations that um, are really not done right. And it could be dangerous and, and you might hear or read about accidents that happen. I know I do and uh, I've done some talks on just this um, safety aspect alone. And it's, it could be a real danger if you don't do it right. So um, I think there's a question that we're gonna answer um, in the Q&A about you know, the long, how long does it take to get the, the still up and running um, you know, until you get to your profit point. And a lot of times what happens is it takes a long time for still to get, um, to be installed and be approved uh, because they run into a lot of issues with fire uh, inspectors, et cetera. So, you know, that could delay you for a long time if you're not thinking along the lines of, of this particular um, safety aspect of your installation. So really what it comes down to is your fire codes, um, C1D2. Uh, is what that's called. It's the C1D2 is is what the codes refer to as as the classification of how explosive an environment is. So there's class one div one, which is the most explosive, and what that means is that under regular operations uh, there will be explosive explosive vapors in the air. That's not the case um, here. Um, you're going to have vapors if something goes wrong um, because what happened the um, the ethanol will actually vaporize at um, higher temperatures and all those higher temperatures are happening within the still and everything is a, is a closed unit. But let's just say you have a leak um, in maybe a CIP arm or, you know, like I said, your chiller shuts down unexpectedly, then you could have vapors that come out. And that's what the C1D2 is, is that you're only going to have vapors in the event that something goes wrong. That's the, the simple way to put it. So. In the event that that happens, there has to be enough safeties in place that you're not going to have an accident. That you know, sure, if something happened, you had some vapors, not a big deal. They're going to be vented out, um, and let's just say they weren't vented out. Then, if there was some kind of electrical failure on any of the probes in the still, then that's going to be mitigated because of some of the safety precautions that we put in. Um, so, ventilation is is the first and foremost thing. You definitely have to have ventilation. Uh, there's actually ways to vent your space um, in an engineered fashion that would even eliminate the C1D2 classification. Um, and that has to be done by an engineer to, um, uh, to, to look at the space, look at the airflow, the makeup air, et cetera. So that's one way to do it is to have um, an engineered solution on your, um, your vapors. Um, and it still doesn't preclude doing um, the C1D2 on your electronics. Um, so that's what I'm going to talk about a little bit here. So if you're in a C1D2 environment, what we call that, or what a lot of people call that red area that I have around that still, they call that, it's pretty harsh, but they call it the sombrero of death. <laughs> what that means is around your distillation equipment, there's an area that if there's a leak, that's where those vapors are going to be. So five foot around the still, 
um, you know, from any point of that still, you know, if you, you kind of look at, look around that area around it, that's where vapors could be leaking out, um, coming, coming out of the still. But as they come out, what happens is the ethanol vapors are, are heavier than air. So they're going to drop down to the floor level and they'll start building up um, on the floor. So that's why they call it the sombrero because the bottom area is 25 feet away from the still. So that area, three foot off the ground, 25 foot around your still area is considered the C1D2 area. So those are the problem spots. Th those are the areas that if there is an issue and there is a spark, then that's gonna cause uh, the explosion. Uh, so what we have to do is make sure that that C1D2 area is, is treated properly. One, you, you typically are gonna have some ethanol sensors in there. They will pick up the ethanol um, vapors. They will go ahead and trigger um, additional ventilation. But what we do in our controls is instead of having a control system that is completely C1D2 um, compliant, um, as far as being inside, that would actually be more of an explosion proof box, which gets very, very expensive. We locate our controls just outside of that area. We're more than three feet above and we're um, five, more than five feet away from the still. And what, what we're doing there is now all the wires that go from that control panel into the still, what we need to do is use intrinsic barriers and also do wiring for explosion proof. So that first picture up in the upper right shows heating elements that are in a bain marie with the explosion proof boxes um, and then also the, uh, um, the proper wiring that's in a C1D2. So if something were to happen to that element, you're protected. It's not going to cause any issue, even if we had tons of, um, of uh, ethanol you know, floating around in that area. The next thing is the sensors. So um, any sensors, temperature probes, pressure sensors, um, et cetera, that are on the still need to be protected not only on themselves, but from any kind of short that might happen inside the control panel. So if there's a short in the control panel, um, we have what's called an intrinsic safety barrier. That safety barrier will take care of any surge of electricity, so there's no chance of any spark or anything happening at the sensor. So those intrinsic barriers need to be built into the control panel, and that's very key as you go through and, and start considering what your still design is going to be. And if you have somebody do the controls, make sure that they're UL698, uh, UL508, which is typically in your brewing panels, is not going to be enough. The UL698 is, a, um, is the UL version, and it could be CUL for Canada, UL for the US, um, and also actually all South America. I know we have someone from Mexico, Costa Rica, so the UL typically is, is fine and accepted in that area, um, but you have to have that UL698 in order to um, properly um, install the intrinsic safety. I'm going to turn it back over to Javian. Um, we're at a 48 minute mark. We want to leave some room for questions, but um, Javian, go on in and um, uh, you can take over from here. For sure. Thanks, Kevin. Um, <clears throat> so now you know kind of what you're in for. Uh, what's next if you want to move forward? Um, so I think one of the, the most important things as far as next steps is going to be figuring out what your local regulations are, right? Um, federal uh, regulations are, are pretty standard, you know, across the country, but there may be some, some other barriers in your local area. So you want to figure out things like, can you even produce beer and spirits in the same location? Some places you can, some places you can't. Um, are you going to be able to sell through your current channels? So do you need to find new distributors, do you, can you sell through your tap room, both products? Um, can you sell direct con to consumer? Um, do you have to have a restaurant in order to sell spirits? Um, these are all things that exist. And so you need to figure out which ones apply to you in your area. Um, so yeah, once you find that out um, or while you're finding it out, you start making your, your plan, um, figure out what, what spirits you plan to make. You, know, you wanna shortlist those. We had a question earlier about um, since you have some of the brewing equipment already, um, does that make your return on investment faster? Uh, and it can. So if you're looking at making uh, spirits that can be produced in a shorter amount of time, like vodka and gin, then absolutely you can start making money on those products pretty pretty quickly. So um, having some of that equipment reduce your you know your your outlay for for new equipment um, to basically just a still. Um, setting aside some, some area, making sure that you're 
following the local codes, uh, any build out that may be necessary and maybe a diaphragm pump and then you can get started. Um, if you're looking to make some stuff that's, you know, kind of longer term, um, still you probably have a better return on investment by adding uh, a still, um, but that, you know, your, your return on investment is still going to take a while because, you know, stuff like bourbon, um, you're looking at a minimum of two years of aging that, um, usually four plus. Uh, if it's if it's less than four years, you have to put a label on it that says it hasn't been aged uh, to the to four year mark. Um, <clears throat> so that longer term stuff, yeah, it's going to take a while to get your money back on that. Um, so then you want to figure out what system is the right size for you. So if you already have an existing brewery, um, I think that's generally pretty easy. You probably just go whatever the double size your fermenters is, or excuse me, <coughs> double size your brew house. Um, so you get some double size fermenters compared to your brew house, and that's probably the size you want to start at. Um, but you also want to do some some calculations and figure out your ROI, how much it's going to cost you for equipment if you need new equipment, and and make those de determinations based on on that info. Um, so this is a good place to start to figure out you know what your production goals are, if you can meet them with your uh, current equipment, uh, your current brew house and, and fermenters, or if you need to add. So like a bigger brew house or, or bigger equipment there as well. Um, then you want to evaluate your space. You know, do you have room for the equipment? Um, as we mentioned earlier, can you put the equipment in the same room as your, your brewing equipment? Um, how are you going to make sure you have the area for the C1, D2 safety requirements? Um, these are all things that you, you need to think about and, and plan for um, if you're going to be adding distillation to your brewery. So, you know, another thing you can do is get some equipment pricing from, you know, the, the right suppliers that, you know, um, kind of know this stuff and can keep you safe. So I'm going to put up a little link, you know, if you want to schedule a one-on-one -on -one with, with me or somebody at Brumation, you can definitely do that. Um, and then we'll, we have some time for some questions. All right. So I'm just kind of looking at the, we had the one question there. I, I believe we might have answered about, um, kind of talked about getting some profits, uh, especially if you're doing white rum, vodka, and gin, um, getting them early. You know, so as as Jamie and I think covered a lot of that, and also if you have a lot of the equipment already and you're really doing your homework as far as the installation, you could really get things going pretty quickly and, and, and get right to a profit. Um, I think Ray also asked about some case studies. Um, I, have to, I don't know if we have any case studies available. Um, we'll take a look at that. We do have your email address and uh, um, and see what we could uh, we could put together for you. And we might be able to reach out to the community um, and um, some of our connections and see if we can get something to you. You're welcome. <laughs> um, Are there any other uh, questions out there? All right, a couple of questions just popped up. Um, maybe Jamie, I'll let you talk about the wood chips a little bit um, on that. I, I think that's that's a nice, um, nice question there. Nice way to go. Yeah, I mean that's a good question. I think it comes down to uh, a few things. This can be personal preference. Um, you can get kind of some of the the same flavors using wood chips if you have the right ratio uh, of wood chips to your to your product. Um, you know, I think that might be something you want to disclose to your customers. And I think some of them may be perfectly fine with that and some people may not. So I think you need to look at um, your market, uh, how mature it is, and if it's, you know, if that process fits with your your space and what you wanna do better. Um, I think it's a personal preference thing. And I think on the wood chip thing, there's, um, there's a manufacturer, kind of a, a company that we talk with, they have um, uh, fermenters that have, or um, aging barrels that are, metal but they have wood staves i said it right in in the sides and that's a real slick way to do it and reuse um that's that's kind of neat um can you make hand sign it hand sanitizer um uh, yeah absolutely um i something new that i've been taking a look at um as far as the hand sanitizer and uh, i know there's some specific formulas that they want you to use but um uh, absolutely you can make that in, in these systems 
maybe javing a little bit on price ranges. It's a very, very broad spectrum there. It depends on the size, but uh, I don't know if you have anything handy that you could throw out. Yeah, it, it really kind of depends on, you know, what spirits you want to make um, and what size and, you know, what existing equipment you have. Um, but if we're talking just the still, um, you know, you can range probably anywhere from maybe like 20K to sky's the limit, depending on how big you want to go. Um, but yeah, it's really going to come down to, you know, do you want a pot still or a column still? Um, what size do you want the still? Um, you know, what spirits you're going to make, because that will determine kind of if you're going to go with a pot still or a, a column still and, and what processes and equipment you need there. Um, so yeah, the, it's, it's a huge range. It's going to depend on, on your personal situation. And the level of controls uh, does tie into that. Uh, so if you're looking yes. for a very basic control panel, uh, that could certainly save you quite a bit of money. Um, you know, one thing I, I certainly would encourage you not to do would be to um, not include all the intrinsic barriers and, and that, but there, there's um, some more economical control solutions. And then, you know, you could really get into ones that with a touchscreen and PLC that, that could add to cost. So there's a pretty good range on the control side as well. And that's something that can be fit to your budget and, and um, you know, still have all the safeties in it. Uh, so, so that's another consideration. Uh, let's see here, got a couple other questions here. Um, uh, Jamie, you wanna talk about somewhere about the TTB input greens? Yeah, let me see. Uh, TTB measuring the in so I thought I read somewhere about the TTB measuring the input grains for taxation rather than the output. Are there any special considerations for managing the brewing side versus distilling with regards to the TTB? Um, honestly, I do not know the answer to that question. Um, I could definitely, if you want to leave uh, your email address, I can probably look into that for you and um, give you an answer, but I don't, I don't know that off the top of my head. And then uh, talking about a standard mash ton with uh, loadering of, of corn mash um, require a solid separator. Um, kind of depends, I, I believe, on that uh, with how you're you're actually milling the corn mash, because certainly that's going to be a lot thicker. Um, and there are some different, yeah, solid separator is certainly something that can be done very easily. And um, there might require a little bit more um, equipment on that side of, it, of things. But, um, we, we could certainly um, chat with you a little bit more about some of those options, but uh, that's definitely a little bit more tricky there. Um, as Katie is asking, if we made tequila or mezcal? I personally have not, um, but I know that uh, folks would, um, you know, certainly do make it with our equipment, <laughs> but uh, it's, it's something that uh, I think is, is quite an art that I can't myself uh, say that I'm good at, and I, I do love my tequila, so. <laughs> All right, but I think we're uh, just about ready to run run out of time here. But um, if you, you know, certainly if you have more questions or if we didn't answer your question good enough, please click on that link or go to the website, uh, vbrewcon, schedule a one-on-one. -on -one, uh, you know, Jamie or myself, we'd be happy to chat with you. Uh, we had this time uh, really carved out to to, to be in, in at the CBC, and um, you know, so uh, we're available and we we. We love to talk, as you can tell, where you've been listening to us for an hour. <laughs> so um, feel free to click on that or, or shoot on over to the website. But uh, thank you so much, everyone, for, for joining. Great questions. And uh, hopefully uh, you, you caught some value out of this and um, you know, we might have a, a new venture to, uh, uh, to go on. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. All right. Take care. Have a great day.